thank you, Casey, for having me on the Blaze Summit. And as I told you earlier, I love your topic uh, for women, no longer my burden. And um, I am a poet and I do like to use my poetry to express uh, things related to uh, social issues, uh, controversies in this universe, uh, racism. I like to talk about breast cancer, domestic violence. Uh, those are just some of the uh, topics. And I have included some of them in my books, um, Lifelines, and this is your year of Jubilee. Uh, I'm currently working on a book entitled Healing America. And I think I'll start there talking about racism. And during the uh, George Floyd uh, uh, summer uh, unrest, the protests, I started writing this book. And I started thinking about the mothers who had lost their sons to, um, you know, being shot by police. Those were those that were unarmed. Um, and, you know, the, the excuse was always, well, uh, I feared for my life. You know, the police would always say, I feared for my life. And I began to think about it and I said, the problem is not that the black men are a threat, but it's because of perception. So perception determines reception. So how you perceive someone even before you encounter them will determine the actions that you take. And so I kind of focused on the mothers and I, I wrote a poem called, um, I just want you to come home. And it says, it's, it sort of goes back historically. So it's kind of back and forth. Don't walk in the woods alone, but if you do go before midnight, stay out of the headlights, travel light. So if you have to run through the river to lose the scent of the dogs, stay close to the trees to hide. Don't breathe, don't make a sound. Don't look up in their faces, look down. Although you are proud, don't show it because they can handle it. I just want, you to come home. Don't move your hands. Don't make any sudden moves. Don't stop on the dark road where there is no light. Don't resist. Don't fight. Even if you are right, because they can't handle it. And some can't see your humanity and your beautiful personality. And I just want you to come home to me. I just want you to come home. And uh, the second one I wrote, and I'm gonna read some of this one um, because I always felt like if people knew the people they encountered, if they saw them differently, they would treat them differently. And this is a conversation between a mother and a police. And this poem is entitled, Meet My Son. This is my son. He was a premature baby, but he grew. And before we knew it, he was in school drawing pictures of purple skies and dogs to cover our bare walls with his frameless masterpieces, the colors still vivid in my memory. I keep his artwork in my hope chest full of moments in his life that made me laugh, cry, and beam with pride. I still have his curly, sicky hair from his first haircut where he tried to act like a big boy in front of his grandfather, a five-star Marine general who saluted him for his bravery. My son was the head of his class. He loved school, played football, ran track, played in the band, and I could not keep up with all the things he wanted to do. In his world, he was safe. He knew he was loved and accepted. He knew nothing of the world outside of his saving that one day he would face because of his rich brown skin tone. I wish he never has to. He did not know that sometimes wolves waited for him like prey to satiate their thirst for black blood and that driving while black, walking while black, living while black or breathing while black was a problem for some people. My son enlisted in the Navy, became a seal full of medals, but they would not know that he fought to protect the rights of those who would harm him. They would not hear how kindly he spoke and would mistake his proud look as defiance. He is strong, but gentle, carried his ailing grandmother like a mother cradling a baby in her arms. I don't mean to brag, but this son of mine is one of a kind. He will leave a mark in this world if he lives long enough. 
His personality is like a magnet drawing people to his warm laugh, like bodies gathered around a bonfire in the cold. His concern for others worries me sometimes. Be careful, I tell him, because he will stop to help every stranded car, never a worry, never a care. If you call him, he's there. Works hard for a living, successful at life, not married yet, but looking for a wife. He's so handsome. But what matters is his beauty within. It shines like his rich, ebon skin. He is my boy, our pride and joy. If you know him, you will love him. Everybody does. His smile will melt the snow caps off the mountains. His touch will fill your soul. His velvet voice echoes like a saxophone as he tells corny jokes and never ending stories. His skilled surgeon hands repairs the faces of women abused. His nonprofit providing shoes for children. He is the ideal citizen, the neighborhood friend, a mentor, a coach. There is no end to the things he can do and who he is. So officer, please, when you stop him for a simple violation, don't see his black skin as a threat, a suspect, or any other things you believe. Take a moment, treat him equally. No need to yell, threaten, or call him any names. You don't need to draw your gun. He's legit, he belongs here. He has nothing to hide, no record, no crime, no drugs in his system. He doesn't even smoke, but he does not judge those who do because his love for people is based on who they are. He sees with the heart and the mind. We taught him to be kind even when others are not. He will greet you respectfully because that is who he is. Don't fear him. He is not your enemy, but I want you to see him like he sees you as a human being, a son, a loving dad, a faithful spouse, a man, not a criminal, a thug or nigger or any of the things you have heard and maybe laughed about at the station or in the club or at your dinner table. I know you don't know my son, but give him the benefit of the doubt. He is harmless, unlike people who are quick to call the police just because he is present in this world. So officer, please, I stay on my knees praying that he will not encounter a rogue police ready to judge, convict, and execute my boy for no reason other than the fact that he is black. All I ask is that you look at his face, look in his eyes, full of compassion and have mercy on him. Treat him the same way you would treat your son or grandson or another innocent white man that you don't know either. Give him a warning or a ticket if you have to and let him go his way. Don't take his precious life away for I want him to come home. His life matters to me. Meet my black son. You will love him. Everybody does. And so that's just one of many points that I've written, trying to talk about um, you know, racism and how we can um, have meaningful dialogues, um, not just push it aside um, because that's the only way we're going to um, get healing in America. And there's a lot more I can say on that topic, but I'd like to talk about another uh, subject that is important to me as well. And um, that is breast cancer. And I've had some friends who, who fought breast cancer. Some have won the battle and some did not. But the American Cancer Society um, states, more black women die from breast cancer than any other cancer. And we know that part of that is due to several factors. One being economic status, uh, this different discrimination, systemic uh, racism. And, but they are working on that, trying to, trying to close that gap and that disparity. Um, and one of the things they're doing is uh, uh, it, uh, the American Cancer Society is doing a cancer prevention study. 
and what they're doing is try to understand how factors such as housing discrimination contribute to inequities in cancer prevention behaviors and cancer risk. So they're working on that. They're also working on um, cancer facts and figures for African-American, Black people, cancer facts and figures for Hispanic and Latinos. And they're also working on um, healthy equity research in cancer control and prevention. So these are just some of the things that they are doing um, as far as um, breast cancer. And it is a, a, a burden for Black women. And a lot of times we do neglect ourselves because we are taking care of everybody else. And so we have to get out of that and, and sort of take care of ourselves and take care of our health care needs so that we would not be part of that statistic. And I have written poems um, you know, related to breast cancer. And one in particular I wrote for some of my friends who were um, who did succumb to breast cancer. And I wrote it for some of them who, once they got the diagnosis, it was like, you know, what do I do now? Where do we go from here? And I wrote this poem and it's entitled, I Am Still Me. Because I encouraged one of my friends, Janet, I said, what do you wanna do? You wanna go to college? Whatever it is you wanna do, although you have a diagnosis of breast cancer, I want you to still do the things that you wanna do. And I said, because you are still the same person. And so I'm going to read this poem entitled, I Am Still Me. These are the breasts where my firstborn nestled and suckled the milk and honey that flowed, nourishing her body and soothing her soul. These are the breasts where the love of my life gently caressed a symbol of my womanhood, a mark of beauty, a part of me that budded like the petals of a rose. These are the breasts that made me look so elegant in my silk blouse and even in my old t-shirt. I now look at them. These breasts that never reached the age of sagging. I look at my chest where they once were, now gone, removed by the surgeon's knife because of the invasive carcinoma that hardened the softness where my baby used to lay her tender head. A scar is there where they once were. My breasts are gone, but I am still here. And my daughter can still lay her head here when she wants to reveal to me her heart. I am still her mother, still a sister, a daughter, a wife, an aunt, a friend, and a grandmother. My heart still beats strong because though cancer took away my breasts, it could not take away my love, my self-worth, my joy, nor my purpose, for I can still give. And I am still me, but stronger, happier, and whole in a special way. My breasts, a symbol of my femininity now gone, but I am still here. And I am still feminine, still beautiful, still sensual, and still lovable because I am still me. And the second poem I wrote in addition to that one is celebrating you, celebrating life. And actually I use that also when talking about my next topic that has been of a great interest and concern. Um, and that's domestic violence, domestic violence against black women. According to the CDC, domestic violence is one of the leading causes of death for black women between the ages of 15 and 35. That's pretty significant. That's a big burden that we've always borne. And one of the things black women, they do not like to report uh, domestic violence or call the police because, you know, we're kind of in this, uh, you know, uh, situation where we're afraid to call police because of what we think the reaction might be. But that should not be our burden. You know, if someone's trying to take your life or, or beating and abusing you, then that's their burden. That's, that's on them. 
not on you. And if you have to call the police, then you have to call the police. Because one of the things that I'm writing, I'm working on a book entitled, um, I Want to Live. And I'm going to read uh, the poem that goes um, with that book, I Want to Live. One of the things that I say to many women who've been abused, and I've been in a bad situation my own self. And I had to come to this decision. And I loved him. I mean, I loved him dearly. And I forgave him every time. But I became very afraid for my life. And I asked myself this question. I said, it's like a revelation, a divine revelation came to me. And it was these words that really woke me up. And it said, you, you may love him with all your heart, but can you trust him with your life? I'm gonna say that again. You may love him with all your heart, but can you trust him with your life? And when I answered that question, I walked away and never looked back. I walked away and um, I was reading an article by um, Bill Al Morris. He was writing about the Colburn place in Indianapolis, Indiana. And one of the uh, topics uh, of his article he says, violence against black women is a disturbing and growing epidemic. Black men, why aren't we protecting them? And um, as I was reading the article, I was reading something, uh, a quote from um, the Indiana State Representative Vanessa Summers. And she said, it's exhausting being a woman, but it's really exhausting being a black woman. And as I read it further, I, I I understood exactly where she was coming from. And I'm gonna tell you her final quote at the end because I think it really hits home. And um, the statistics show, according to the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence, the NCADB, it said more than 40% of black women have experienced intimate partner physical violence, intimate partner sexual violence, and or intimate partner stalking in their lifetimes. And more than half of Black adult female homicides are related to intimate partner violence. And, and some of the questions the NCADB said, one of the reasons that it's so high, it says by intentionally denying Black people access to economic opportunities, the ability to build intergenerational wealth, healthcare, education, and a sense of safety from governmental systems, racist policies, increase the prevalence of risk factors for domestic violence. And one of the second things they said that is a barrier, it says these systems create numerous barriers for survivors seeking safety. Law enforcement officials often arrest black survivors and police, jurors and judges are less likely to believe black survivors than white survivors. Racist systems put Black people at a greater risk of experiencing intimate partner violence. And one of the third things, of course, is economics. And also the community. There is a, a theory in the community. Um, one of them is religion, and I'm not opposed to religion at all. And often we say we take things to God. And I remember growing up in the church and some of the young ladies were abused. And I remember the older women telling them, stay with your husband, stay with your husband. And as a teenager, I started saying, well, why would God want them to stay with someone who's beating on them all the time? What well, doesn't God love them too? And so, you know, often, and people say, we take it to God and don't let people know what's going on inside your home. That's what the church is for. So the churches also need to be more educated and, and more proactive 
and more of a resource in helping women uh, through this situation. So it's not just our burden, the burden also lies on our community. It lies on our churches. It lies on our men. All of us have to be a part of making that better for women everywhere. And so one of the poems I wrote, um, I have several poems on domestic violence. I even have one for um, young people, um, which I, I may do that with as well because even um, teenagers are victims of domestic violence. But this poem is entitled, I Want to Live. I can't breathe. And I'm afraid to walk too hard on the floor and wake you from your sleep to be slapped and kicked and punched for disturbing your rest, even with our baby growing inside my womb. I can't breathe, even though the words I want to say linger on my swollen lips. I dare not even whisper, silence and violence rule my life. And I can't breathe, I can't scream, I can't dream. Everything I do is wrong, every word is wrong, every effort is wrong, I can't breathe. I can't even sing a song. My hands are numb as I sit watching the ticking clock second by second, sucking the life out of me. I can't breathe because of that grasp of your angry hands around my neck. Hear my pounding heart suffocating like a river whose tank is empty. My chest ready to burst, racing to the surface, fleeing death because I can't breathe, <laughs> but I want to live. I want to live. I want to live is the title of my, my next book, um, talking about domestic violence. And just for fun, and just in case there are any young people in the room or anyone who has any teenagers, you might want to share this poem with them. It's actually a skit. <laughs> so you can just imagine, I always had a young teenager to, um, to be the person that I was talking to. And this poem is entitled, Sweet 16. Sweet 16, what's that on your pretty face underneath those lashes I see? A bruise that your makeup can't cover up. Did your boyfriend beat you up? Did he hit you and make you cry? Then said that you were the reason why he was mad and things aren't right. You are the cause for the fight. If you love them, then you stay. He hits you, but he loves you anyway? Well, let me tell you, girl, it ain't true. If he really, really loved you, he would treat you like a queen, not tear down your self-esteem nor destroy your free voice, taking away your rights, your choice, where to go, who to see. He will freely let you be you. He would not inflict hurt or pain and call you all those obscene names. Listen to what I'm telling you, girl. There is true love in this world. Love is kind and love is real. Love is more than a passing thrill. Love lifts up and love makes strong. A uh, Bruce has to stop but love goes on. So don't let anyone take your life away. You have a future and it starts today. So, so that's for my young people because young girls think it's kind of cute that the boys are acting jealous and um, all of that is abuse. Trying to tell them who to see, where to go, et cetera. So those are also you know, things to think about as well. Um, so domestic violence and breast cancer are both part of my um, projects that are dear to my heart. I've actually done programs at Emory University on human trafficking. And I was very honored that the um, assistant DA for um, DeKalb County came and also the Internet Crimes Against Children. They also came and they, you know, inform the community about you know human trafficking and how you can 
recognize it and how you can help because there are so many um, young black girls that are abducted all the time. And so just thinking more on this topic um, about no longer my burden. And I said, I wanted to read a quote from the um, representative. Uh, she said, uh, I love this so much. She said, black women, she said, it goes through so much, Summer said. I think a lot of it is that we need more self-care and self-love. And then we wouldn't go through these things any longer. You know, and I said, she is so right because we, we wanna be everything for everybody. We take up the slack, you know, 70% of households are headed by black women. Um, and so we sacrifice so much and leave ourselves with so little. And I've written these, last two poems I'm going to read. And one of them is an encouragement to black women everywhere. You know, all of these things are not just our burden. It's everybody's burden, it's everybody's concern. And we don't have to bear everything alone. You know, we don't have to neglect our health care. You know, take your burdens and turn them into missions turn them into quests, turn them into activism, you know, so we can help one another, you know, so, you know, don't put off your medical care so your grandson can get some expensive sneakers or something, you know, we don't have to be the Jesus on the cross, bearing everybody's burdens, neglecting ourselves or neglecting our lives, because we are so valuable, and we have contributed so much to this world, historically and now. We have contributed so much. It's immeasurable. I heard a representative say one day, one of the congressmen, senators said, uh, well, black women, they're only 6% of the population. Like as if in America, like as if that didn't matter. I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, and why did he find that necessary to say? I said, that's irrelevant. We might be 6% of the population. It's not about uh, quantity but it's about the quality that we bring. It's the quality. And I'm gonna do my signature poem. I think Casey has heard this one. <laughs> and this one is called Living and Loving. I gotta put on my shades to do this one because <laughs> it's a little hip hop in it. Gonna be a little bit cool or whatever, but we're gonna take a mental vacation. And that's what we need to do sometimes. Take a mental vacation sometimes and take care of our mental health as well. Take care of our mental health. Don't feel guilty about relaxing. Don't feel guilty about saying no. Don't feel guilty about none of that. Take all those burdens off your back. And I want you to start living and loving yourself. And this poem says, Today I decided to spend more time living and loving myself, like the baboon whose bottom is shining like a crimson moon, exposing her natural beauty. It doesn't matter who laughs or thinks otherwise, it is her glorious bottom and she's not ashamed. I decided not to live in shame of my voluptuous body, nor the moles that embellish my thick and tan skin. I am going to strut like a flamboyant peacock, just because I am alive. Today I decided to leave the debates for the debate team because I wanna talk about love and life. It makes me so hard. I wanna kiss the sky. I wanna talk about the galaxies and explore my history and roots that lead me back to Africa before slavery. I want no bashing, no boasting, just celebration and toasting, my dear family and friends, my lovable children, and the spectacular earth and sky. I want to learn the songs of the birds and sing a melody to God as they do. Hallelujah. I want to fly and soar. I want more out of life. There is no room in my gray matter for confusion and strife. Well, I want to sing and dance and prance all over the place. I want to rise, shine, and be filled with grace. 
I want to be the honeybee that sucks the sweet nectar of life. Let me lie down in green pastures, not wallow in the muds of past failure or despair. Let the rains of heaven wash away my pain and restore my soul. Let me laugh <laughs> like the hyena. Let my free spirit run with the wild horses that drink from the rivers of living water. Let me sit under the tree with the wise poets and chess masters unraveling the mystical game of life. And then let me sit down at the table of humanity together with people of every age, race, gender, and nation, sharing the bread of peace, love, and harmony. Let me meditate on this. I want my mind to be uncluttered, unencumbered, unbound, unchained, free from the stresses and messes that create static, which interferes with the frequencies of my joy. So don't disturb me with foolishness, pettiness, negativity, or crass, meaningless words to interrupt my flow or waste my time. Because I only have time for living and loving. And if you got time for that, then I got time for you. And that's living and loving. And that's my signature poem. And I'm going to close out this oh let me take these off so i can see <laughs> can't see with those it'd be cool with them but i can't see so i hope every woman every black woman in their space and in their time remember that they are important their lives are important their self-care and self-love is vital and so all of you, I'm going to celebrate you with this closing poem called Celebrating You, Celebrating Life. And let me see if I can bring the poster over so you can see it. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I hope you can see that. <laughs> Okay, I'll stand up and do this final one. So just remember we are not burdens and we're not carrying any more burdens because we're gonna live for us. Celebrating you, celebrating life. Put that down. Now I'll come back to the screen. You made it, you came out. You survived, you can shout, you can live and give and have your being. You have a new way of seeing yourself, whole and strong, tried and true. You are even more beautiful. You can think and grow and love. You are more than you ever dreamed of becoming. You are a star, you are a light. You have faced the darkest night, but hope and courage carried you when you did not see your way through. Through the tunnel to the light, you are going to be all right. Celebrating you, celebrating life. Thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Clap it up. Uh, Y'all, listen. <laughs> yeah, I listen. Uh, Miss Brenda puts it down. Miss Brenda puts it down. Okay. Uh, she's so incredible. She loved y'all very, 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 very much. Um, she just, <laughs> she just flipped me an email letting me know that she unfortunately uh, can't grace the stage right now. Uh, but she does send her love. 
She was very excited, very, 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 very excited about this segment. Her segment is actually called Living and Loving, okay? Um, and I met Miss Brenda during the pandemic. Don't put any limits. Let me say, don't put any limits on what you can do, okay? I met Miss Brenda during the pandemic over IG Live, literally, literally, okay? Uh, we were stuck in the house. I love poetry, so I started having open mic nights on IG Live, literally. <laughs> uh, there was this, this community, this, this lifestyle brand, a wellness lifestyle brand that I had started called Freedom and Fragility that came out of my, my book, my first book, um, talking about breaking the cycles of silent suffering. And so I hosted an open mic night and I called all poets around the internet, right? To just pull up to the mic um, and spit. And Miss Brenda showed up. <laughs> and she showed up again and again and again. Like I, I did it in the States. I did it when I came to the continent. And um, I had to put freedom and fragility down. I'm speaking to somebody right now um, because... Many times, right, as you step into your entrepreneurial journey and you're juggling a couple of things and things that are so beautiful to, to you, freedom and fragility, most of y'all don't even know what that name is anymore, right? Like, literally, we've grown so much that most people I say this to don't even know what freedom and fragility is. But that was my first baby after my book. I believed in that deeply because I believed in breaking the silence of cy the cycle of silent suffering. And, and showing up to talk about the things that nobody's talking about. Because in my book, I talked about my abuse, my trauma, and my PTSD, right? And so we did Freedom and Fragility. Uh, definitely hired Raven over there on that side. Blaze wasn't even a thought. Like, literally, it was no thought, right? <laughs> and when I launched Blaze and started coaching in business, I knew after some time that I had to put Freedom and Fragility down. Raven probably remembers this conversation. I cried. Mocha was one of my staff members on Freedom and Fragility. Mocha would host the open mic nights. It was growing, it was thriving, but there was something about showing up for Black women in business. Even back then, I think it was 116 people, not the 6,000 we have today, okay? Uh, over 6,000 as of today, it was about 116 people. And I told them one day, I said, y'all, I got to put this down. And it hurt. Raven. Raven spoke into my soul. Mocha spoke into my soul. And here we are. Um, I think it's been a year, Raven. <laughs> I think it's literally just been a year, okay? Uh, and by the thousands, Black women have, have joined Blaze, and we're doing exactly what we did over there. Full circle moments. Mocha opened up the summit with poetry. Miss Brenda showed up on day three to open us up with poetry. Raven works for Blaze now. Like, I literally didn't know. I'm speaking to somebody, okay? Um, man, the universe got you like, like the universe, trust, trust what you feel more than what you see. Trust what you feel more than what you see. Trust what you feel more than what you see, because here I am implementing everything that I did on the freedom and fragility side in business. Huh? How does that make sense? <laughs> um, but here we are, okay? Uh, she loves y'all so, 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 so deep. She sends her flowers, okay? Um, and I want to take a pause, right? And, and Ms. Ms. Brenda and I um, are aligned on this. Before we get into all the sessions of today, because we're at the middle point. We're at the middle point, okay? Um, I need y'all to start opening up your mouth. You have been poured into over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And we got plenty more, okay? But I need y'all to start opening up your mouths and proclaiming some things, even when you are afraid to talk about it and say it, even when you are afraid, whatever the spirit has on your tongue right now, and it's right here, it's right here. I need y'all to start opening up your mouths. And whatever you need to proclaim right here, we got to take a beat before we get into the rest of these sessions. Because it's time for y'all to start opening up your mouths. Okay? I want you to raise your hand. Whatever it is on your heart to say right now, this practice ground right here, you home. You home. And the way you're moving here will determine how you move out there. I promise you that. I promise. You ain't going to be scared after this right here. I said a stat earlier. 
in the last session. And I know a lot of y'all didn't believe me. I know it. I know it. And it's not your fault <laughs> because they have intentionally relegated our stories to very, very, very small statistics without any context or explanation. And so we are here thinking that we by ourselves and we are shining and embarrassed when we should not be. What I said in that last session was that 75% of all black women entrepreneurs have a college degree or higher. And they and we still, we still don't know what the hell is going on. <laughs> right? We still struggle. We're still underfunded. Right? I'm gonna drop this in the chat because Forbes literally announced this last June. Literally. This is your proof. They don't tell, they won't talk about this. It's okay. Forbes literally, and they hit it. They literally hit it at the bottom, but it, it says plain as day. More than three-fourths of Black women entrepreneurs have at least a college degree. We are literally the most educated, literally the most educated cohort of entrepreneurs in the whole country, okay? And we still don't know what the hell is going on. And that's why when Blaze did our 140-page research report, we have to figure out what the hell is going on. And so what we've learned is we try really, 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 really hard, okay, uh, as black women to prove ourselves and to pay all the money to refine ourselves and to speak the right language and and to make sure we remove ourselves from things that have stigma and bad connotations we try really 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 hard so what i'm telling you sis is it ain't your fault you did everything right you did more than enough right okay what is missing is faces like this literally <laughs> what is missing is spaces like this where you can open up your mouth and say it in your terms, where you can ask real questions and get help for what you really need because college ain't teaching you that. You ain't did nothing wrong. As a matter of fact, you are the only demographic where 75% of the people you look to the right and left to have a college degree and you still underfunded and you still won't, you don't have sponsors and you still don't have a mentor and you still <laughs> struggle to find network, okay? You ain't did nothing wrong. As a matter of fact, are we, let, me, let me tell y'all something. This, but this is why we have to change the game. Because if college ain't doing it, don't worry about it. Keep your coin, baby. Let, I'm, I'm going to say this my chest. This is why we have to start our own businesses and our own platforms without permission. Okay? So that we move and grow and go higher and what and that's why today is all about what you gonna do now. That's why we're talking about activism, Miss Carlin. That's what we're talking about uh saying cold for season, bruh. <laughs> that's why we going it. That's why we're talking about the gravity of no, okay? Because when Blaze went and dug into that statistic, we saw that oh, what well, damn, nobody with a college degree think it prepared them. So why are we wasting that money? Why can't we tell our next generation, like, like, baby, don't, don't, don't waste your money, don't waste your time, don't waste your self-esteem. Let us bridge you there faster, right? More effectively. This is why your business must be birthed. This is, yeah, 140 pages. Yeah, 140 pages. Oh, it's full of our stories, and it's big. Oh, it's, it's big. I'm talking about colleges have reached out and said, well, damn, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, but this is why. This is why we need spaces like this, and not just my space, okay? Uh, black women have to live in the land of plenty, and so we need you, sis. So I need you to open up your mouth right now. You're going to keep being poured into, right? But I need you to proclaim the things that you are about to do in the world, and I need you to show up and do it. You do not need another certification to be worthy. I told somebody this this morning. Just like a seed that becomes a tree, already has everything it needs inside of that little seed literally from the onset it already has every single thing it needs to become the tree on the inside we can't put it there <laughs> it's already there that is you you already have what you need plenty of people told me my mentors etc told me man casey yeah you call but you need the master's degree to get up inside of them walls and I literally believed him for when I was like, okay, I got to pay $200,000 to go to Harvard ooh, to prove myself, blah, blah, blah. And something in me was like, hell no, you don't, sis. It kept saying that. And I defied, right, those, those colleagues <laughs> to do that. And here I am. I don't regret it a second. I, and, and I got my coin. Okay, I didn't spend no money on that, right? Um, so put your hand up, okay? Hit the hand raise button. I'm bringing you up here, okay? And again, I just showed y'all the proof. Forbes said it in June of 20, 
21. I didn't make it up, but it, they, they don't talk about this. They, they don't talk about the fact that it ain't our fault that we underfunded. How the hell we got 75% of degrees and y'all ain't giving us no money? 0.64% of venture capital goes to us. How the, how the hell? 61% of us are funding our own businesses alone with only our own money. That's double. That's double the amount of, of, of other people that don't look like us, yet we got the most college debt. Anyway, we about to start our own, right? So go against the grain, set your own rules, okay? Build it, they will come, and you have a whole tribe of support. I mean that. Blaze ain't going nowhere, right? So so open your mouth. Chandrell is gonna start us off. What are you proclaiming right now, Chandrell? And then I'm bringing you up, Butterfly Love Hugs. Hey, Grand Rising Queens. Um, thank you, Casey, for bringing me up. Girl, like you spoke right into my heart. Like, like just last night, I was even praying like, God, I'm like, when I tell you I'm releasing everything that no longer serves me and I'm going to become who I've been destined to become. I know I have purpose. I know there's a calling on my life and I'm not letting nothing else hold me back. Nothing else hold me back. Nobody. And I know that my business can change so many lives because I have a story to tell. I know just by hearing you guys, like every day I've been able to see myself and every single woman that has come up here. And just with you speaking about the whole college thing, I literally just signed up for college because my mom went to college and she's an RN. My sister is a nurse practitioner and they stress themselves but yet still not receiving what they want and i see that and i'm like why do i have to settle for that i don't i don't, don't. Nope. literally just signed up for school and it's like in my head i'm contemplating like you went this long and i don't even think god i don't have the, a lot of school debt i'm six thousand dollars in debt from school and not because i i decided to let it go i was like there's another way i don't have to do this i started my own business the, the moment that I take the, the, the focus off of my business, my business is it's going to slow down. Like, why not put all that energy into my business? I've seen, I've studied so many people who drop out of college, who have, don't have a high school diploma, but are billionaires and millionaires and are successful. Listen. Okay. Like I, I even tell my daughter that like, school i understand you know i don't i don't press that on my child because i'm like i see so much more in you if you decide if you're telling me now you don't like school she's an honest world student now but if you're telling me you don't like school and this and the third like why am i gonna teach you how to become an entrepreneur now so when you become 18 you're already prepared for what's to come say that and sis I and I'm I'm building I'm 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 gonna show my babies not my have a, also have a black little boy that I need to teach and I'm I'm gonna be everything that I've been called to be I'm gonna share every gift before I leave this earth I'm gonna share every gift that I have to the world and I already said I'm starting forget waiting till next year I'm starting today and yeah. changing that today I don't need to wait yeah. because time is an illusion. You know what I'm saying? Time is an illusion. Yeah. We don't have to wait. We don't have to wait. We can start today. We can yeah. make that change today. As soon as that hit our spirit, we need to go ahead and say, okay, I'm I'm gonna start working on that today. One day yeah. at a time. Like my business, I I I'm gonna declare it now. My business is gonna be a six figure business coming next yeah. year. I don't know how yeah. it's gonna happen, but it's it's gonna happen. Okay, yeah, Just networking. The networking, like I've been waiting for people to network with and people to talk to and give me advice. And I've been stressing myself, taking master class after master class and doing yeah. this. I'm, I'm losing my mind trying to keep up with all this stuff. Like I got to put this into action at this point. So I'm ready, girl. I appreciate this. Thanks for talking to me. Like I, even last yesterday, you were talk, we were talking about the nine to fives. I said, man, I left the work field a long time ago. And here I am trying to forfeit my blessing, my business that I invested in. Like, no way. No yeah. way. Thank you, girl. Thank you. Thank I appreciate you, mama. that. You, you very welcome. And you said it with your chest. So listen, it's already done. I say, and we're going to rock with you on the journey. I promise you that, Chantrell. I promise yes. you that. Thank, Thank you, you, mama. So beautiful. So, 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 so beautiful. 
I am bringing you up, butterfly love hugs. Please do tell us what you are proclaiming. Say it with your chest, sis. It's time. She coming. All right. And <laughs> blessings. Peace and blessings. I sure needed this. Casey, I'm in such a transition in my life right now. Um, I'm a 57-year-old, uh, 57 year young, shall I say, a black queer woman. And I love, absolutely love inspiring and, and teaching our teens and young adults, especially black teens and young adults of all sexual orientations, how to flutter their potential. That's my brand, Flutter Your Potential. My flutter is actually an acronym for my signature program. It's seven phases to a powerful life transformation. So it's forgive yourself, love yourself unconditionally, understand who you are, trust your intuition, think differently. And the concept is once you start to do those things, you naturally emerge and rise to your greatness. Um, but I'm in a transition right now. You know, do, um, like a lot of people, I found myself, um, you know, out of, of career opportunities during COVID and the doors still haven't opened for me. Um, I'm, I need to move out of my apartment um, by December 28th. And right now I don't have a, an address. I don't have, I don't know what the universe is doing. Um, but I got to figure out how to live my dream and monetize my gifts and, and what my, was on my heart to give back to the world. You know, I've, I've been serving my community for many, many years. I'm an educator and an artist, I'm a creative. And those are the things that I want to do. I want to create safe spaces um, for, for our youth to come and, and learn how to be entrepreneurs, learn how to be civic leaders, because we need them in our community. And I've been trying to figure that out and connect with the community and the tribe of, of other women. And like you said, the funding too, to, to make that dream a reality. And uh, so I, I don't know if any of these ladies on the call are in, in the San Diego area. I live in Oceanside. I um, would love to connect. If, if you are, maybe we can start some conversations. Um, but I got to be open to possibilities in, in 2023 because I can't go back. Ashe, um, I give so much honor to you in this season. I give so much honor to you in this season. And though it is painful and though it is scary to let go of control, okay, I... I encourage you, sis, I encourage you to surrender and relent, even as it means, right, asking for favors in this season, even if it, as it means sleeping in borrowed rooms or on couches in this season, even as it means stepping back from being a tool that produces and pours and shows results and, and absorb and being a sponge, right, reading books and following your, 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 your role models on Instagram and, 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 and just surveying them, right? Even as it means just journaling, it might feel unproductive, right? To do this for several months and to absorb and to heal and to think and reflect. But I promise you, I promise you, you will not be the same once you surrender, right? Once you allow your village to show up for you and they will, sis, they will. Once you give your yourself time to um, remove the indoctrination, right? That has toppled itself on top of you and start hearing yourself. Because again, like the seed already has what it needs to become the tree, it's on the inside, but we've silenced it with fear and these thoughts of scarcity and productivity and all of these distractions, okay? Um, I promise you, I prom even as painful and as scary as it is, I promise you sleeping on them couches ain't gonna break you. <laughs> the sleeping in them borrowed rooms ain't gonna break you. Reading them books ain't gonna break you. I would highly recommend um, uh, in your reading, okay? Um, and some of these books you might have already read, but Hood Feminism, read Hood Feminism. Read Hood Feminism. Um, Launch by Jeff Walker. I would personally recommend listening to it on audiobook, okay? Launch by Jeff Walker. Listen to it on audio book. I'm, talking about, I, I'm saying don't do nothing. I'm saying don't write no business plan. Don't like I just need you. I ask for you to be a sponge and relent to this season right here. OK. Um, and then. Right. Not now. Not not now. OK. And then I would recommend you join uh, when your time. You'll know in this time. But I would recommend you join a community called I Fund Women of Color. I Fund mm -hmm. Women of Color. OK. 
Um, yeah. It's a dope community of a lot of black women who want to raise funds. But I would say be part of the community first. Just learn what's worked for them. Learn how they monetize. Learn what their struggles are. You don't have to do anything, right? Um, but let the village show up for you. Um, and we here, sis. So listen, you're going to receive a whole lot of resources and emails and invitations to stuff. But I, I appreciate you for opening your mouth. Like, I, 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 I send so much light to you in this season. You're going to be okay. Better than okay. Love received. Appreciated and sent back to you. Okay. Thank you, mama. Enjoy the rest of the summit, girly. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate you. You're welcome. I say, I say, folks are opening up their mouths. I love it, love it, love it, love it, love it. Um, again, as a reminder, okay, we have uh, our sessions starting at the top of this hour. Listen, we ain't even started <laughs> the blade socks and the workshops of the day, okay? Uh, but this piece is important, right? So that y'all show up to this with authority and keep on absorbing, right? Right? But the call to action is that you open up your mouth. We're gonna hear one more. We're gonna hear from Sharon, okay? Um, but just so you know what's about to happen, what's back to go down, uh, we're about to have Rakita show up with a session called Sankofa Season. And then we're gonna hear from Dr. April, April Murdoch on a session called Girl, Go Get Your Money Right, okay? Um, Sharon, we have 90 seconds. I'm bringing you up, mama. Please do proclaim to us, okay? Um, whatever you want to proclaim right now. Lord have mercy. Um, my camera is janky again. Um, you good? I, I, didn't, I didn't even get a chance to hear the poetry segment, so I'm going to go back and listen to it. I came in as sis was manifesting her six figures. I okay. That's when I came in. And so I was just like, are we manifesting? Okay. That's that's I what we do. So um, I, want, I just wanted to say to the room, please, y'all, do that. Uh, Cause I did it about a year ago, maybe even two. And when I did that, not only did I, <laughs> thank you, Victoria. Um, not only did I get accepted into Cornell's accelerator program, they, uh, because they were like, oh, this is a, a 10 month waiting list. I got in after two days. I got in, I got in on a wait list for an accelerator where they were teaching you the secrets on how to be a consultant. I've been consulting for two years now. I finally had, you know, this has been my best year. So I when you say. manifest, you do, you, they come, they come through. They come I through. Say. So and yes, congratulations, I'm like this. Thank you, boo. Thank you, boo. Uh, oh, this God. year I was, I was a speaker at the Blaze Summer Virtual Summit. And that yes. was something I had never done before. So yeah. when I say you got to manifest, you got to speak it. You got to put it out into the universe. The universe don't know what you want unless you tell it. You got to put it out there. I was saying to a lady last night, ain't no, don't nobody know who you are unless you tell them. I say. You better say. tell the universe who you are and what you want. I say. Because ain't, God needs to hear it. God want to know. God knows what's on your heart, but the universe needs to know too. Put it out there. Say it. Speak it into being. Because he go, it's gonna come back to you, sis. I promise. I promise. And what I'm asking for, I need me a couple of podcasts. I need guests. I want to be a guest speaker. That's what I'm manifesting for 2023. I've had this podcast on my heart since 2016, since my baby girl was a baby. She is the inspiration for the title. She breathes life. So I cannot wait to hear mm -hmm. stories. I cannot wait to share and put your story out there. I call myself an entrepreneurial griot. I love telling stories. I love sharing the word. So I am here for it. That is what I manifested for 2023. So let's go. Let's get it. And I can't wait to commune, commune with y'all this, this day. Let's go. I say. And it's already done. Y'all, if you want to be on her podcast, I see Chand Chandra already put it in the chat. DM her, right? Literally click her yep. name, send a direct message, or y'all can exchange information and get it get it locked so we can already have the first quarter of 2023 full. All right, y'all. Thank you so much, Sharon. I love you, mama. All right, y'all. So we are heading into the first session of the day. I applaud you all for dropping your proclamation in the chat. It is so, it is real now. It is out of your body into the world. It is real. It's already real. 
I appreciate y'all for coming to the stage. Let's go over and rock with Rakita in her session called Sankofa Season. I'll see y'all on the other side. Peace.